Welcome to season two of Creative Solutions for a New World Climate and Artist Series. I'm Frances Littman, your host, and I'd like to gratefully acknowledge the Coast Salish people of this region and First Nations worldwide. For thousands of years, the abundance that these lands and waters provide us to live, work, and play is due to the reciprocal relationships by which Coast Salish and the world's first peoples have lived and lived today. Every Wednesday from 11 a.m. to noon until the end of November, we will be featuring more than a dozen incredible world-class speakers, authors, artists, songwriters, and passionate creators who will explore how we can, we can and will accomplish a new global reframing of where, why, and how we live. Multi-award winning author and environmental philosopher Kathleen Dean Moore opens our series today and will be introduced by our United Nations University partner, Bob Sanford. As many of you who have seen season one may recall, Bob Sanford is a force of nature. Not only are these some of the many books he has written or edited, but Bob is the Global Water Futures Chair in Water and Climate Security at the United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment, and Health. Welcome, Bob. I understand you've been experiencing some wild weather in Canmore, where you are based. Thank you, Francis, for inviting me. And yes, it's been interesting. Very nice today, I should say, but... Interesting week, snow down to the valley floor, and heavy fire smoke in the air Monday and, uh, and Tuesday. But as I said, it's, we're back to reasonable weather right now, not like in the U.S. in some places, that's for sure. Snow and ash, right? It's, it's just a wild combination. And today's program is very timely, given no one seems untouched by the many climate events happening worldwide. I understand that uh, Kathleen is someone that you've known for a while, and you're going to tell us all about her. Well, the first time that I met Kathleen Dean Moore uh, was in a webinar she offered to a Saskatchewan environmental conference long before anybody was thinking about pandemics and and long before we all learned how to connect on Zoom, and that she received a, a standing ovation for her webinar tells you something about the power of her ideas and her ideals. And uh, the first of her many fine books that I read was her 2016 masterwork, Great Tide Rising. And uh, the book is subtitled Towards Clarity and Moral Courage uh, in a, a time of planetary change. And Moore began that book by noting that culpable wrongdoing is defined as knowing and intentionally doing unjustifiable harm. And what we're doing to this wondrous heaven called Earth, we are doing knowingly, willingly, and recklessly. And in ransacking the world, Moore says we are failing in our moral and legal duty of restraint. It's immoral, she asserts, to think and act as though all ecosystem services exist to benefit only one species at one moment in time. And more is of the view that we have to align with evolutionary processes rather than try to bring them to an end. And we cannot address threats like earth system collapse and climate change without granting natural objects, other species, ecosystems, and natural cycles, the rights of personhood including the rights of protection and restoration. And we have to challenge the morally unsupportable claim that it's possible to mitigate the destruction of a natural place by creating a new one elsewhere. And uh, she puts our humanity ahead of our economy. She, she asserts that we need to construct a business model that respects the real value of ecosystems rather than simply creating markets for repairing the uncalculated and often uncalculable damage we do to them as a matter of prescribed course. More interesting also, interesting also is attacks the sloppy manner in which we fall back on optimism. Uh, the work of hope, she argues, is not tied to wishful thinking, it's tied to right action. And she believes that we have a moral obligation not just to fix things for ourselves, but to restore the system for everyone. And to do that, we need a new narrative one that includes respect for the rest of the life we share on this, this planet with and whose presence we rely upon for the stability of the Earth system that makes our presence even possible. And as part of this new narrative, we also need to create 
a new sense of time that extends forward to include future generation. And that narrative she offers calls for a fierce, determined, informed, relentless citizenship. And one of the questions she asks is, what can one person do? Well, she answers, stop being one person. So at no time in history have we needed voices like hers more than we do now. And in this transformational moment, it's an honor to introduce Kathleen Dean Moore. How are you doing down there, Kathleen? Thank you, Bob. You know, um, how are we doing down here? I uh, will tell you that I am in the United States where things are awful in every respect. Um, half the people, 46% of the people are yelling, make America great again. And the other 56% are praying, please God, make America into Canada. People are locked down by a pandemic that a third of the population thinks is a hoax, even though it's killed 183,000 people, a third of them people of color. And thousands of people are nearly kneeling in the streets to protest police violence, while the police and white militias club them, egged on by the president, this flaming face of opportunistic rage. California's on fire. My Oregon is on fire. My beautiful volcanic peaks are on fire. I'm here at home. Do you notice the yellow air? Breathing ashes and cinders, as if Mount St. Helens had in fact just erupted. In the same time, climate chaos is screaming warnings in the language of yet another super hurricane, and critical ecosystems are collapsing. So yeah, oh yeah, the, uh, the Russians are hacking the elections. So, how are we doing down here? Well, fine, thank you. A bit whiplashed a bit betrayed, but on the whole, this old philosophy professor, this old climate hawk, climbs out of bed every morning feeling better about the chances of the sizzling, souring world than I have for a long time. Not just feeling better, but feeling positively energized. Why, you might reasonably ask, because this is what a paradigm shift looks like. Energizing, vertiginous, squealing, on edge, as change cranks this heavy creaking wheel of the world to make a great turning towards something new. So it's an exciting time. It's an altogether breathless time, a portentous time, as the world pauses, panting, I can't breathe, holding its breath to see what will happen next. We should not be surprised that a paradigm shift is a time of bullies, and shouting. And the closer we get to real change, the louder the shouting and the stupider the bullies. But we have come to a time of rare, real and rare clarity. And that makes all the difference in the world. I've been reading poetry, Mizuta, Masahide, late 1600s, Japan, a haiku. So I'll read it twice. Barns burned down. Now I can see the moon. Barns are burned down. Now I can see the moon. There, the burnt barn, the glittering embers of the edifice of lies we have told ourselves. The spurious justifications for wrongs we know cannot continue. The excuses we made for institutional cruelty, embers flaring to life with each wind and dying back. This is the structure that we built to fire and hide the moral insanity of the dominant culture burned down, the way families in the Middle Ages burned their own homes to stop the plague. And there suddenly is the moon, rising through wind that rattles the windows, the moon pouring milk white light across the prairies. We each stand in a black pool of our own moon shadows, and our minds alight as never before. We see the open space where we can build it all again and get it right this time. We've been pretending everything's okay, right? But all along we've known that something was terribly wrong with the death dealing culture. The dying forests, the drained marshes and the melting Arctic plains, the homeless camps, the immigrant camps, the prison camps, poisoned fields and brown city air, miles of pump jacks and oil trains, highways 12 lanes wide, 
It's the extraction industry's great going out of business sale, leaving our children whatever's left torn and bleeding on the sales rack. Now, no matter how we tried not to see it, we knew that a dominance culture never made any sense and couldn't continue. Dying. All the dying, the economic investments in dying, the political collusion with dying, and the furious defense of the instruments of death. We knew. But the truth of the matter was occluded and confused by lies. But now in the new moonlight, we suddenly see our situation for what it is. Rebecca Solnit describes the despair and the excitement exactly. Everything's coming together as everything comes apart. You can think of a paradigm shift as the end of a great experiment. A paradigm is a worldview, a culture's answers to the three main culture structuring questions. What is the world? What is a human being? And how then shall we live? Any culture constructs answers to these questions. Call it a grand hypothesis. Then the culture tries them out living for hundreds of years within the structure of that great barn. At some point though, a culture asks itself, so how is it going? Can a culture thrive in this edifice? If the answer is no, the culture flips, sometimes very quickly, and builds itself a new worldview. That is where we are today. The best metaphor for a paradigm shift is a hydrological one that came to me in Alaska. I want to read you from the rules of the river, which appears in the book Bob mentioned, Great Tide Rising. Some years ago, I was writer in residence in Denali National Park, living with my husband in a little tar paper log cabin on the east fork of the Toklat River. June, solstice, Alaska. It was murderously hot. At midnight on the porch of the cabin, 104 degrees an all-time record drawing a new spike on the graph of jaggedly rising temperatures in Alaska. There were all-time record numbers of mosquitoes too. I would rather be bitten than hot, but my husband would rather be hot than bitten. So I was lying half naked on the bunk slapping mosquitoes and next to the wall, my husband lay completely covered by a white sheet as still and dismayed as a corpse. All the doors and windows were open to let in any relief, even though the doors were studded with spikes to discourage grizzly bears. Another terrible choice, gnawed by grizzlies or slowly roasted to death. If I heard any snuffling, my job was to leap out of bed and slam the door. I had come to the Toklat River to think about global warming, and it was not going well. We're all caught up in a river rushing toward a hot, stormy, and dangerous planet. The river is powered by huge amounts of money invested in mistakes that are all dug into the very structure of the land. A tangled braid of fearful politicians, preoccupied consumers, reckless corporations, and bewildered children, everyone in some odd way feeling helpless. Of course we despair. How will we ever change this current? There was no way I would fall asleep that night, so I pulled on clothes and walked to the bank of the river. The Toklat is a shallow river that braids across a good half mile of gravel beds, dried stream courses, and deep dug channels. Sloshing with water from melting glaciers, the currents looked unpredictable and chaotic, but there were patterns. You're all river people up there in Canada. So are we in Oregon. We've played in river currents since we were kids. We know the rules of rivers. We know how to build dams. We know that any disruption that slows a river can reshape the current. Where water piles against an obstacle, it loses energy, drops its load, and makes an even bigger obstacle, right? As water curls around the obstacle, the current's own force turns it upstream. Yes? When there are so many obstacles and islands that a channel can't carry all its water and sediment, it crosses a stability threshold and the river finds a different way. To change its way, a culture doesn't have to stop the river. What changes the course of a river 
are myriad acts that get in the way of the current, deflect complacency, obstruct profits, block business as usual, refute lies, create something new, every kind of snag and subversion. At some point, the current will slow, lose power, eddy in new directions, and create new systems and structures that change its course forever. The technical term for that abrupt change is avulsion. Avulsion. It's a hydrological term for the moment when the stream bed has so many blockages that it can't carry its load and it flips, sometimes overnight, and carves a new river course. That's the hydrological term. The philosophical term for this is a paradigm shift. I believe we're on the verge of an avulsion. At this point in history, our work is not to save the old worldview, but to save the planet from the old worldview's destructive power. So let's study the smoking trusses and timbers of the old structure. What do we see in the wash of moonlight? I call the old worldview the dominance paradigm. It's a worldview that could not be better designed to serve the interest of those who would wreck the world for personal profit. You could almost imagine enlightenment philosophers called into a board of meetings of the world, board of directors meeting for the whole world. There they are around a mahogany table beside a whiteboard, shooting their lace cuffs and asking, okay, so we need a good worldview. What we need, not, what do we need 99% of people to believe in order for them to grant us, the 1%, the social license to take it all, even if it means the end of the world as we know it. Let's see, Professor Bacon, what do you propose? Soyez silencieux, Monsieur Descartes, vous aurez votre tour. What is their answer that they propose to the question then, what is the world? Lots of dead stuff, lots of spiritless, unfeeling stuff an infinite storehouse of natural resources to be exploited, mined out, used up, plundered, poisoned, and burned for the sake of human progress. It has no value except for dollar value. It has no awareness, no spirit, no pain, no wisdom. It follows that even a culture that prides itself on accumulating wealth instead of sharing it, even a culture that gobbles up the fecundity of the planet instead of nurturing it, even an economy that eats its own feet, even an economy of infinite extraction can plunder forever without destroying the sources of its sustenance. How convenient it is for people to believe this if you need license to reduce owl nesting sites to toilet paper or to reduce singing marshes to open pit mines or to reduce Earth's future to that of Venus, a planet that does not, it should be noted, support life and at the same time to think that all this is right and inevitable. We know better now. That barn's burned down. From the bacteria in the living rocks to the larks in the living sky, the earth is alive with feeling, striving creatures, glorious in their beauty, astonishing in their design, powered by the urgency of ongoing life. The earth is valuable beyond human measure. And if the good English word for that is sacred, then let us use that word. Because the sacred earth is resilient and finite, it follows that a lasting economy will be one based on restraint, respect, and renewal. So let's go back to our philosophers. What do they want us to believe about a human being? What do you think, guys? Human beings are the lords of creation, masters of the universe, the philosophers say, the highest link in the great chain of being. They are the only beings on earth with minds. Their technologies are so clever that they can solve every problem, even those wicked problems created by their technologies. Because they are so smart, each one a very stable genius, they can live in a world made of their own lies. Because they are deciders, they don't have to follow the rules of cause and consequence, not even those imposed by nature. Moreover, humans are individuals who are born selfish. They achieve their greatest glory in the zero-sum competition for wealth, which is a necessary and sufficient condition for human happiness. And this is important. 
The best people win this contest. Inferior people lose. Or so the scientists, or so the philosophers say. But we know better now. That barn also is burned down. Ecological science, environmental philosophy, indigenous wisdom, and almost all the religions of the world are converging on one insight that all creatures are interconnected and interdependent. Each depends on the others. All thriving is mutual. There is no natural hierarchy of worth among Earth's beings. If we, and say, whales, have evolved as interdependent and equally remarkable parts of a morally worthy whole, then we acknowledge also the moral unity of life. Moreover, human creatures we now know are creatures who are born to love. As claws and fangs are to Ursus Horribilis, the grizzly bear, the superpower of Homo sapiens is the ability to form and nurture communities of caring and common purpose. That is our power and that is our hope. That and the ability to foresee the true consequences of our choices and change direction. This is good news, as Charles Darwin points out. It's not the strongest of the species that survives, he said, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. So then, number three, how then shall we live? The philosophers put their heads together again. Well, there will necessarily be winners and there will be losers. Some people are going to have to sacrifice if others are going to achieve this level of wealth. How are we philosophers going to make people think that this is not only as it should be, but inevitable? Their solution is ingenious. Sacrifice is designed as the act of giving up something that you value in order to get something else you value. That's a good thing, right? That's rational. If people want the comfort and convenience of say, oil and gas, let's just take one example, then of course they will have to sacrifice something in return. Quite a lot, as it turns out. Consider, for example, the Alberta tar sands, a sacrifice zone of 14 million hectares. The diameter of the tar sands impact is four times longer than the diameter of the crater dug by the asteroid that ended the era of the dinosaurs. Easily visible from space as a pocked and puckered scar, this is what National Geographic calls the world's most destructive oil mining operation. This will serve as our example. The massive wound is the visible manifestation of a long chain of sacrifices. In order to mine bitumen on this scale, corporations have to sacrifice the land. That's okay, the land is disposable, the philosophers have told us. See number one above, what is the world? Just dead stuff to be used for human ends. When the corporations sacrifice the land, they sacrifice the plants and animals of the ecosystem. Also disposable, according to our worldview, see again number one above, what is the world? It has no awareness, no spirit, no pain, no wisdom, no inherent worth. When they sacrifice the ecosystem, they sacrifice the homeland, the subsistence livelihoods, and the rights to life, health, and fresh water of the people, who also must be regarded as disposable. See number two above. What are human beings, according to the philosophers? They achieve their greatest glory in the zero-sum comp zero competition for wealth. The best people win, inferior people lose. So that's how we shall live, with sacrifice of just about everything, from magnificent forests to human dignity. Whoa, let's burn that barn down. In the clear light of the moon, we can see that we wouldn't have climate change if we didn't allow sacrifice zones. And we wouldn't have sacrifice zones if we didn't allow people to be treated as disposable. And we wouldn't have people regarded as disposable if we didn't have racism. Climate injustice requires social injustice. But let's be clear ourselves. We know better than that. To sacrifice is to make holy, from the Latin sacra, holy, and facere, to make. We know that a sacrilege, a sacrilege, is a violation of what is regarded as sacred. That comes from the Latin sacrilegium, from sacrilegus, 
the stealer of sacred things. The infinitely extractive capitalism is a stealer of sacred things, the achingly beautiful world, the future of the beautiful children. And the dominance paradigm worldview is its justification. It's a sacrilege. Enlisted as foot soldiers in the war against the world, we privileged people have not loved enough. We have allowed ourselves to think. Was it, it, what is it to me if they're hungry or cold or displaced from their home? What is it to me if their habitat is destroyed or bulldozed, their means of subsistence, subsistence destroyed, and their offspring die of hunger or despair? If extinction and misery are the price to be paid for prosperity, how convenient that we can send the bill to the animals and the poor and the displaced. That barn is burned down. Greta Thornburg called us out. Shame. The times call for new sacrificial rituals. Let us kill the fatted calf of the dominance paradigm by taking away its social license to steal and destroy the sacred earth. Let us find again the sacred in what we have been persuaded is only raw material or natural resource. Let us find again the sacred in all the people. By these rituals of purification and atonement, let us, as people have done since ancient times, work to restore a right relationship of human beings to each other and to the sacred order. Adrian Rich said, my heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I cast my lot with those who, age after age, perversely, with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. But is there any hope that we can reconstitute the world and make it over again in a new way? Don't worry. We don't really need help. Really, we don't need it, at least not the usual kind. Let's change our view of hope, too. Hope is part of that same dominance paradigm that judges everything by its outcome, its gain or loss. Well, people say, if we don't have hope, we'll fall into despair, but that is a trap. If I have hope, if I believe that everything will turn out all right, despite what I do, I don't have to do anything. That's a moral abdication. Or if I fall into despair, believing that everything will be a disaster, no matter what I do, I don't have to do anything. Another moral abdication. Hope or despair. I don't have to do anything. But that's a false dichotomy. Because between hope and despair is this wide expanse of moral integrity. Doing the right thing. Not because it will produce a good outcome. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. But because it's the right thing to do. We defend human rights because we believe in human worth and dignity. We act lovingly toward the earth because we love it. We live simply because we don't believe in taking more than our fair share. Because everything in our hearts and minds recoils from the old dominance paradigm. Because we believe there is a better way to live, a way that fully honors our humanity, we work to reconstitute the world. Ethical action is thus not a matter of outcomes, but a matter of character, matching our actions to our moral beliefs and deepest values. I want to read to you an essay that I have just now written. Um, the, the picture you see is painted, or, yeah, painted by Bob Haverluck, who is a Canadian artist. And it is from our book called Take Heart, Encouragement for Earth's Weary Lovers. A long time ago, in a small house in Amherst, Massachusetts, a young woman named Emily Dickinson sat at a table beside an open window. As filmy curtains blew over her page, she wrote her famous poem about hope. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the song without the words and never stops at all. Long after she died, artists illustrated her poem with a bird that seems always to be a perky little thing, sort of a cross between a bluebird and a wren, with its fluffy tail and open beak, a juvenile to judge from its big head. I protest on Emily's behalf. That is the wrong bird. 
Remember, this was 1861. White supremacists were gathering in armies and marching north. Loggers were advancing through the continent's virgin forests. Black slaves, having fled rape and lynching, hid in her neighbor's barns on their ways to Canada. Malaria, typhoid, and cholera ripped through families. The dyings have been too deep for me, Emily wrote, and before I could raise my heart from one, another has come. I say if hope was perching in her soul, it was something far fiercer than a bluebird. I'm going to suggest a bald eagle with its hooked beak and terrifying claws. An eagle, like the one I once saw come swooping over the inlet, swing out its awful yellow talons and grab a pink salmon off the water. The eagle flapped to rise with her prize, but her wings caught in the waves and she fell back, raising a murderous ruckus of light and sea. Then resigned, the eagle settled on the water and began to swim her prey toward shore. The nearest rocky point was a half mile away and the tide was running hard, but the eagle judged her trajectory, hunched her elbows into scoops, pulled them through the water, and in this way paddled to shore, dragging the struggling fish. A fog bank blew in and blew out again. To the east, a cloud layer obscured the sun until up it rose, gilding the water. Through it all, the fog and the gold, the eagle paddled on. Finally, it reached the ro broken rocks and clawed onto shore, exhausted and bedraggled, dragging up a still flapping salmon. Gulls had been waiting on shore for the eagle, no doubt hoping that they would be gifted with tasty scraps. This was not to be. As the eagle tore into the salmon's belly with a beak like an ax, the gulls sidled closer and closer. But the eagle had only to turn her magnificent profile toward the gulls, fix them with one terrible golden eye, and the gulls flinched, hopped into the sky, and fled. This is what hope is in hard times. Not a sweetly singing wren anticipating good fortunes, nor a gull passively waiting for someone to bring him what he hopes for, abdicating any responsibility to feed himself. Hope in hard times is ferocious. It is strong and razor sharp. It is wild. It is stubborn. It is driven. It may choose its time, but it seizes its chance with open talons and drags it to shore, no matter how long that takes. Hope uses all its strength and wile and never gives up, knowing that if it stops trying, it will drown. It's not a bluebird that sits on Emily's shoulder, tweeting comforting songs into her ears. Picture instead an eagle that pins her soul in its protective grasp. The eagle stands tall and straight on Emily's shoulder, lowers its eyebrows over piercing gold eyes that sight along the deadly weapon of its beak, and calls a screeching call that sounds like rocks scraping against a metal hull. Emily is right. There are no words to this song. Hope is an animal cry of rage and will. I happened to walk out of a meeting with the public relations manager of the American Petroleum Institute some years ago. That's the lobbying arm of the oil and gas industry. He was a big man, shaved head, black overcoat. Hollywood could not have typecast a better villain. It was just the two of us, and so I thought, Aha, this is my chance to call him to conscience. So I said to him, do you have children? He turned on me, stuck his finger in my face, and here is what he said. Don't you ever, 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 ever underestimate the power of the fossil fuel industry. Sorry, big boy, that barn's already burnt down. To build a vision of a thriving world and defend it against the last furious gasps of the dominance culture will not be so much about hope as about struggle. So call in all the feathered things that are perched somewhere in your weary soul, the harpy eagles and the sharp shin hawk. Call in the cassowaries and the shrikes. Call it whatever character traits Velociraptor and the extravagantly feathered Tyrannosaurus Rex have perched in your reptilian brain. Hope is not what we need. 
What we need is strength. Strength in numbers and strength in moral conviction. What we need is shrieking, roaring courage. Thank you. Ooh, that was incredible, Kathleen. Thank you. Bravo. I can see why your webinars get standing ovations. I just, um, yeah, I can't thank you enough. I'm sure everybody feels the same way. First of all, let me just say, Kathleen, what an astonishing, wonderful presentation. And I'm inspired once again by Great Tide Rising and all of your ideas and ideals. And you were most interestingly, calling for a complete societal transformation long before this outbreak of pandemic. So I may ask you two uh, related questions. And now on top of all of the environmental and social injustice you described in Great Pride Rising, we have a pandemic and an alarming political situation in the U.S. It seems sometimes that it's not just the barn that's burning, but the whole farm. And... Uh, my question is this, how do these two circumstances affect this extraordinary moment of potential transformation? <laughs> that is a good question, Bob, and that is a big question. You know, um, the pandemic has taught us a great deal. Um, people can change. We can change fast. It's taught us that we can get along just fine without a lot of harmful things like long commutes and air travel and supported and um, imported food. It has taught us that people can come together, right? In creative associations of caring and communities of action. Um, and that they can be heroic in their coming together. And it's taught us that humans can be unbelievably selfish and that they'll follow a leader who justifies their most cruel inclinations. But the bottom line, I think, is that we've learned that we're not, we're not invincible, right? And we've also learned that democracies are not invincible and that both of them can be destroyed by things that are very, very small and reproduce very, very rapidly. And that's what we're, that's what we're seeing. Um, well, thank you very much for that. And I just have one last question for you. Um, I live in Alberta, uh, home to the sacrifice zone to which you referred in which National Geographic calls the world's uh, most damaging mine operation. And here the oil industry and the government are indistinguishable from one another. So my question is this, uh, how can in this transformational moment, can we generate an avulsion? Uh, uh, and break the stranglehold the fossil fuel sector has on government power. Do you have any ideas on how we might use this moment for that? You absolutely put your finger on it again. Um, the avulsion, get in the way. Make it hard, make it expensive, make it prolonged, make it embarrassing. Um, we have to take away the social license to do that. We have to take away the legal license to do that. And we have to take away the moral license. Um, we're already getting started on the social license, right? We're already starting to see banks stop loaning the money. It's embarrassing. You don't do this. It's not what, what, what socially conscious people do. Um, we've seen a lot of people divest, a lot of institutions divest. It's not socially acceptable. Um, we've seen the falling costs of, of renewable energy. We're also seeing people taking away the legal license to make such terrible mess. And I'm it's fantastic. Everybody from this DC Consumer Protection Bureau suing them for threatening health and lying about it to right here on my own coast, the crab fishermen suing them for having destroyed their crab season. Um, but let's also take away their moral license. And I think the biggest campaigns against this government fossil fuel collusion is going to come from human rights campaigns. And we're already seeing this in many ways. Um, my colleagues and I have already taken the fossil fuel fracking industry to the Permanent People's Tribunal, which is a, a social society, international human rights court. And their, their advisory opinion has just come down. They say that the fossil fuel industry and in particular fracking and the governments are an axis of betrayal. 
So that's the kind of thing I mean when I talk about how we might take away their moral license and, and call them to account to protect, to protect human rights. Thank you so very, very much, Kathleen. Yeah. We have a question here from Claudette Priest. Um, she said, thank you for an inspiring talk. In your opinion, Kathleen, what is the effectiveness of activist groups in the battle for saving the planet? And I think you've answered some of that, but love to hear more. Um, I think that's what we've got. That's what we have working for us, that activist groups. I think that, um, that they're smart. They are courageous. They are brilliantly strategic. They are well, well informed in how to move people to action. And I think we're seeing the fruits of that all around the world. Um, the, the young people are teaching the elders, the elders are teaching the young people. I think activist groups are going to save us if anything does. And First Nations, absolutely. Well, First Nations have taught us all a great deal about action. Have they ever? Yes. 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 And um, some people have said that they're the last front line of defense. And, and really, it's, it's so um, heartwarming to see that they're, you know, they're, they're really a lot more coming together of everybody. Because that's, as you said, in your, in your book, The Great Tide Rising, you answered the question that virtually everyone wants to know. And one that really resonated with me was the question of, as Bob said, what can one person do? And I love your answer. Stop acting like one person, right? right, right. <laughs> and so, you know, this is, I, I'd like to just jump in and say, this is one of the reasons why Creatively United exists. Uh, we act as a solutions hub for individuals and groups wanting to make a difference. And I invite you all to check out Creatively United's free online event calendar, our resource section, our videos, our pair up directory. It's all at creativelyunited.org where you can learn about who aligns with your values and where to find other like-minded people, ideas, events, and groups intent on creative solutions for a new world. And on that note, I would like to introduce our partner in good, Jonathan R. Reardon of the Gail R. Reardon Climate and the Arts Legacy series in honor of his late wife, who was the former cellist um, with the Victoria Symphony, a beloved music teacher, and a friend of the environment. And he's going to tell us what's in store uh, for next week. But I also think he has a number of questions. Because, <laughs> John, you always do. Welcome, John. Thank you, Francis. Um, before I talk about next week, Kathleen, I was totally inspired by your presentation and the courage that you have portrayed. And I think you're all giving us courage in the way we can move forward as a group. But what I'd like to ask a question is, you know, the, um, I'm supporting Climate in the Arts in my wife's name. And I'm interested in your thinking about what role the performing arts can play in advancing the kind of courage and individual activity that you were talking about this morning. You know, um yeah, I always go back to, to Friedrich Hegel, who said, we have art in order not to die of the truth. We have art in order not to die of the truth. And you think about what, what could that mean? And it always makes me think of Medusa. You know, Medusa was so horrible with all the snakes in her hair that just to look at her would turn you to stone. And isn't that what's happening? That, that our, our crises are so multiple and so horrible that when we look at them, we are turned to stone. But along came Perseus, right, with his winged sandals and his magic sword and his reflective shield. And he held up that shield. He didn't look at her directly, but he looked at her reflection in his shield. She was there, but she wasn't there. She was transformed and revealed. And so he was able to reach out his sword and cut off her head. And I think that's what art does. It reflects to us it allows us to see, it calls us to witness, it calls us to account, um, showing us, allowing us to see the, um, the, the, the problems that have to be solved, the terrible things that are happening, so that we can reach out and slay them, to use a metaphor. Um, at the same time, I think it's really important that art, and particularly the performing art, remind us why we need to do that work. And that is because the world is so beautiful. And we are so full of beauty ourselves. Our fingers can sing. Um, I wish I could have met your wife. Um, 
art reminds us that there is nothing more important to save than the beautiful singing world. That's gorgeous. Well, we're on the subject of um, art. John, would you like to mention about uh, our forest ballet? Absolutely. And Creative United shared with um, Ballet Victoria a video called Awaken. And it's a story of a young girl who is uh, following a hummingbird into a forest. And it talks about the importance of forests in our ecosystem and the need to protect and preserve natural forests in our urban environments. It's a wonderful moving tale and it will be released uh, in a premiere on the 8th of October with a ba special performance with Ballet Victoria on its uh, screening of the, uh, the Little Prince. So there'll be more information on Creative United about the video and we hope that uh, some of you who are listening to this webinar will be able to attend. So John, before you tell us what's coming up, do, would you mind if I take two questions that have come in? No, not at all. Okay, excellent. So the first one's from Sandy Goldie. Um, she asks, have you heard of the movement to declare ecocide a crime worldwide? And how can we move that forward? Yes, yes, there's, there's wonderful movements all around the world um, focusing on the rights of Pachamama Mother Earth and uh, the personhood, the personhood of natural objects, natural things, birds, rivers, mountains, um, and that uh, they have a right to life. They have a number of rights that are encoded actually in international documents to exist, to maintain their own integrity and so forth. So I think it's a very, very promising notion. Um, if we're going to be talking about human rights, you can't have human rights unless you have nature's rights. You can't be healthy unless nature is healthy. And on down the list, you can't have water unless nature's water is healthy. So I see that, um, that the movement to declare hurting the earth to be ecocide is very much um, very, very promising. And I'm, I'm really glad that she, she mentioned that, gave us a chance to think about it again. Mm -hmm. Thank you for answering that. Bill Phipps asks, in your writings and presentations, it is clear you see the climate crisis as a spiritual and moral matter. Yet most conferences, books, writings, webinars, etc., focus almost entirely on technology and smart human innovation. How do we rebalance the discussion and the actions? We, um, my, my colleagues and I were at a gathering of philosophers. We said, what can we do to add to this conversation about um, uh, about climate change and, and we, we decided that we were going to try to do as much as we could to make it clear that yes, it's a technological problem. Yes, it's a scientific problem. It's a national security problem. It's an economic problem, but at base, it's a moral problem and it calls for moral response. So we asked a hundred of the world's moral leaders to answer the question, do we have a moral obligation to the future to leave a world as rich in possibilities as our own? Um, we got back an incredible number of, of beautiful responses which is now published in a book called Moral Ground. So he might want to take a look at that. Um, people respond very beautifully also, if you want to just be pragmatic, to appeals to beauty and love and spirituality in ways that maybe they aren't quite so reached when it comes to technologies. That's why we have a Climate in an Artist series, because it really does meld the two so beautifully. And the power of music, the power of art, we have programs like that coming up. So we'll hear from um, Bob, who illustrated that beautiful poem uh, or, or writings that you have there uh, with Emily. And also uh, Janati, um, who did the, our banner image. Oh, just fabulous artists. So you'll, we'll be hearing more about that. And John on, oops, wait a second. I think another question has come in since then. Well, there's Janati now, uh, Ivanov. <laughs> and he's, hello from the UK. Incredible, interesting talk. I am very impressed with the philosophy and depth of this talk. I see how many troubles and problems in the US. And I would like to ask, is your government really reacting to your conversations and art? Are there any results of this conversation and talks? I don't know. Maybe, maybe we don't do it to get results. Maybe we do this work because we believe it's important and right. And we have no choice. Do I think the American government is responding to the kinds of arguments I made today? 
<laughs> uh, no. No. I don't think the American government, federal government, is responding to reason or ethics in any, in any manner. Um, power, maybe. Peak. Um, but I'm not looking for that kind of a response so much as a response um, in, in the people. It's not going to be, what, whether we solve this, is not going to be because of some sort of moral awakening on the part of the federal government. It's going to be coming from the conscience of the streets. And I think that's now where our work is. Mm -hmm. I think consciousness, which we'll be learning more about as well in a couple of weeks here on September 23rd, we're going to be talking about collective consciousness. It's so, it's a subject that I think a lot of people are just maybe starting to tune into in a bigger way. But I, I really feel hopeful like you do, that there is a real awakening and, and it is coming at the consciousness level. Um, there's another qu two questions have popped in. Uh, Dale Stanway says, how do we reconcile care for each other, humanity, and the thought that there may be just too many people on this planet? I'm not sure I see those as in contradiction. I understand the arguments that people make that say that we've gone beyond the carrying capacity of the planet. I'm inclined to think that's true. I understand the arguments that people make when they say that the people that... Um, that we have to be really careful because when we talk about reducing populations, it's also always, not always, but often the um, populations of others rather than ourselves. And that that tends to make it hard to talk reasonably about that. Um, certainly we would have an easier time making, making the kind of restorations that we need if there, were, if there were fewer people on the earth or if there was more wild space. E.O. E. O. Wilson says that we need half earth to be taken from humans and given to the wild creatures. Um, I don't see how we would do that if we didn't have fewer people, but maybe there's a way. Um, I'm encouraged by the way education for women and the increase in the regard for the rights of women is cutting down on the population increase. Um, I think we will live to see it reverse itself. And the CBC actually the other night did a fabulous program called uh, the Good Ancestors, yeah. and and uh, you know it, it made a very valid point that there's been billions of people before us, um, and they existed with the world and each other, and we seem to somehow have this narrow view that it's just us, and that what about those future generations, and therefore we really need to be looking at our own actions and what we're doing rather than saying, well, there's just too many of us. And that's basically what it's, it's saying, like working together, as, as you mentioned, that we are in this together, that we are interconnected. We can do this. We've got this. And yes, population may be a factor, but I love what you said about the environment, you know, making more of that space available. Let's look at all the ways that we can have a healthier planet and less uh, possibility of, continued pandemics. And Sandy Goldie just added one comment here. She, <clears throat> she made a very valid point that um, even though maybe at the federal level, governments don't seem to be responding, many local and, you know, municipal governments are responding. So we, we, have, we have evidence of that. Oh, and uh, there's another comment that has just come in from an Anne Shao. Uh, she loves your anthology with the reflective shield. Perhaps our responsibility is to be part of that reflection, both on a grand scale and on a very personal scale, joining with many different groups and also engaging family and friends in moral, poetic, musical, artistic, as well as in practical ways. Thank you for the re-inspiration. So on that note, I think we're going to go back to our very inspired John Reardon, who if it wasn't for John, we wouldn't potentially have this Climate in the Artist series. So John, over to you. Tell us more. Thanks, Francis. I'm really pleased to promote uh, an exciting webinar next week at the same time. It's called The Transformational Moment. What have you learned so far? Well, the answer is a lot. The whole seminar will be in three segments. The first segment will review what the key transformational moments are of season one and what a wealth of material is contained in that season. I had lots of difficulty in scheduling what are the top messages and because there were so many great ideas presented in season one. 
We'll also have a peek at what kinds of transformational moments we can expect in season two. The second segment will consist of um, a brief presentation by Bob Sanford on the role of the UN in looking at uh, the climate crisis and biodiversity. And I think Bob is going to talk about the need for the UN to transform itself so it can take the lead in leading the globe through this climate crisis. This is the 75th anniversary of the UN and never has the United Nations faced a more important moment in its history. The webinar will be completed with a couple of presentations by um, some of our colleagues in looking at reconciliation with First Nations across Canada. And they're specifically looking at creative solutions, so which is formerly a part of our series uh, title. Marilyn Fair and Michael Miltenberger will present their creative solutions for reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities in Manitoba. And we will have a special guest cameo performance who will talk about the similar solutions that are taking place in the Yukon Territory. In Canada, we simply cannot tackle climate change and restoration of ecosystem function without genuine reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities. So to recap this exciting session next week, Brian Yoon, the principal cellist with the Victoria Symphony Orchestra, will play a jig for one of Bach's cello suites. So Francis, it's going to be a wonderful session next week and hope we all tune in. Thank you. Absolutely. And thank you, John. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Bob. And thank you to our local and international audience for tuning in. Bye for now. <laughs>